we have prepared a um, talent print report for all of you, which will be sent to your email address, which you registered. Um, there are actually some very positive key findings from the report. So I'll just share a little bit before I hand over to the speakers. 30% um, of companies in Hong Kong are looking to increase their headcounts this year. 62% of those currently employed anticipate they will be looking for a new job this year. Um, although Hong Kong registered an economic contraction between 5 to 7% in 2020, nearly 30% of employers intend to give out a salary increase in spite of and 35% of the companies intend to give up bonus payments. Out of these companies, 35% would give more than one month. So the top sectors which we see hiring includes financial services, retail, professional services, tech and telcos, um, and FMCG. Um, and top job types includes finance, tech, marketing, digital, and PNC. So we will send out this report to all of you today. Um, and if you have any questions, you can follow up directly with us. Yeah. To echo on this, our panel of speakers today believe 2021 presents a real opportunity for us. We're extremely honored today to have a very, very strong panel to share the insights. Um, so I'd like to introduce them. To kick us off, we have Mr. Simon Wong, former partner of Orange Beginning, who will share insights in relation to the IT reform in Hong Kong. With the new regulations in place, we should continue shaping the IPO landscape and on the trends to expect over 2021. Then we have Mr. Henry Chong, CEO of Lucent, who will share more in relation to the transformation of the financial services industry with the change of technology. And I believe anyone who has interest on digital assets, please um, send your questions in the QA and I will give you some tips from Mr. Henry. Then we have Mr. Ken Lo, co founder and chief strategy officer of Hong Kong FedEx will share with us in terms of how institutions in wealth management and capital markets are tapping into the digital assets space, development skill sets required to join the industry, and how you can help skill yourself if you have an interest to join. Finally, we have Jason Wong, head of financial services from Invest Hong Kong, who will share an overview of the market where his team supports investments and promotion from the Hong Kong government. And it'll be interesting for us to understand what they have in place for Hong Kong this year. Um, once again, throughout the session, we welcome all of you to send your questions in the chat. Um, and in the end of the Q&A session, we'll, we'll choose a few questions for our um, speakers, okay? So without further ado, I'll pass over to Simon to get us off. Thank you, Olga. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, let me share my screen. Hi, I believe we all agree that 2020 was a year of turmoil with the outbreak of COVID-19 and the global economy experienced the biggest slowdown in recent decades. People were pessimistic about the economic and stock market performance, seeing drastic measures taken by governments, such as large scale lockdowns affecting normal business activities. The economic downturn and poor market sentiment have led to expectations of poor capital market performance for 2020. Turns out, Year 2020 saw an increase in the total funds raised from Hong Kong IPOs by 26% compared with the previous year, totally 397 billion Hong Kong dollars, while the number of new listings dropped by 15%. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange published a number of consultation papers in 2020. Amongst them, consultations on corporate weighted voting rights beneficiaries and main board profit requirements are likely to have bigger impacts on the Hong Kong IPO market in 2021. Given the time limitation, I'll only focus on the proposed increase in the main board profit requirement. Any company planning to list on the main board of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is required to satisfy the qualifications for listing set out in Rule 8.05 of the listing rules, except for certain companies in specific sectors. One of the requirements under Rule 8.05 is the profit requirement, which currently requires that a listing applicant to have a total profit attributable to shareholders of at least 20 million Hong Kong dollars for the most recent financial year and an aggregate profit attributable to shareholders for of um, 30 million Hong Kong dollars for the first for the previous two financial years. 
The current profit requirement has been around since 1994, and no change was made to it since then, even when the stock exchange increased the market capitalization requirement in 2018. The stock exchange believes that it is the appropriate timing to consider an increase in the profit requirement and hence conducted a public consultation in November last year, proposing two options for the increase. Option one raises the overall profit requirement by 150% with a minimum profit attributable to shareholders of 50 million for the first for the most recent financial year and an aggregate of 75 million for the preceding two financial years. Option two, on the other hand, raises the overall profit requirement by 200% with the minimum profit attributable to shareholders of 60 million for the most recent financial year and 90 million for the two preceding financial years. The proposed increase in the profit requirement will lower the implied historical PE ratio of listing applicants from the current 25 times to 10 times under option one and eight times under option two, which is at a level similar to the PE ratio before the market capitalization requirement increased in 2018. The proposed increase in profit requirement is also aimed at deterring the creation of shells for subsequent disposal by majority shareholders to further distinguish main board from GEM, attracting only sizable companies that can meet high market standards to list on the main board and to improve the overall quality of um, main board issuers. Companies that originally planned to list on JAM, pre-revenue biotech companies, and those other companies that can meet the new profit requirement will not be affected by this proposal. The proposed increase will surely force some of the intended applicants who just marginally met the current profit requirement out of the game, unless they turn to list on JAM, or if they're willing to wait for a few years to see if they are able to satisfy the new profit requirement. The new profit requirement does not only apply to new listing applicants to, to the main board, but also applies to GEM listed issuers who intend to transfer the listing from GEM to the main board. With the increase in the profit requirement for new listing applicants, the stock exchange expects the number of eligible companies to be listed on the main board to drop drastically based on the number of applications received by the stock exchange between 2016 and 2019. About 60% of these applicants would have become ineligible for listing under the uh, either option one or option two of the new profit requirement. Companies in the early stage of development or small to medium sized companies, which have lower profits, will be affected by the new profit requirement. But this certainly does not mean that they will be refused access to the capital market. These companies can still consider to list on GEM and raise funds for their future development. And when the time comes that they can meet the new profit requirement uh, for the main board, they can apply for transfer of their listing from GEM to the main board. The stock exchange acknowledges that there are companies who may have um, already commenced their listing projects on the basis of the current um, profit requirement. As the new profit requirement is expected to come into effect no earlier than 1st of July this year, the stock exchange believes that there should be sufficient time for these applicants to prepare and submit their listing applications prior to the effective date of the new profit requirement. The stock exchange will assess the listing application submitted prior to the effective date of the new profit requirement under the current profit requirement, and such applications are allowed to be renewed once after the expiry of the initial application to continue to be assessed under the current profit requirement rule, provided that such renewal is made within three calendar months from the expiry of the initial application, is not withdrawn by the applicant, or not returned or rejected by the stock exchange. What can we expect for 2021? Since the proposed change in profit requirement if eventually adopted, will come into effect not earlier than the 1st of July this year, and together with the proposed transitional arrangements just mentioned above, which apply to applications submitted prior to the effective date of the new profit requirement, it is not difficult to foresee a surge in the number of new listing applications and transfer of listing applications to be submitted prior to the effective date in order to catch the last train for assessment based on the current profit requirement. Applicants who have commenced their IPO uh, or transfer of listing projects would definitely speed up the process with a view to submitting the application prior to the effective date of the new profit requirement. I've also noted that since the publication of the consultation paper, a number of sponsors have been actively pursuing potential cases 
trying to persuade and convince companies considering listing on the main board or a transfer from GEM to the main board to kickstart their process in order to meet the last day for submission prior to the new rule becoming effective in order for to have their applications assessed under the current profit requirement. In addition to the proposed increase in the profit requirement, the passing of the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act by the US government in December last year, and the publication of the consultation conclusion on corporate weighted voting rights beneficiaries are also likely to increase the number of listing applications to be submitted to the stock exchange this year. The act will serve as a driving force for more US listed Chinese companies to apply for secondary listing on the stock exchange pursuant to chapter 19C of the listing rules. The act requires auditors of US listed foreign companies to allow the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board to inspect their audit paperwork as a means to protect investors and further public interest in the preparation of an informative, accurate, and independent audit report. The US SEC is empowered by the act to prohibit securities of any company that fails to comply with such requirement for three consecutive years from being traded on national securities exchange. Among the top 10 largest Hong Kong IPOs in terms of funds raised in 2020, three of them are a secondary listing of NASDAQ primary listed Chinese companies, ranking first, third, and sixth. All three of these secondary listing companies are in the TMT sector, and their total funds raised comprise approximately 18.5% of the total IPO funds raised in 2020. TMT continues to be the hottest sector, ranking first in terms of total funds raised in Hong Kong IPO market in 2019 and 2020. With the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act becoming law in the US and the successful homecoming listing of US, Chinese, US listed Chinese companies in Hong Kong in 2020, we can expect the number of homecoming listings of US listed Chinese companies to continue to grow in 2021. The consultation conclusion on corporate weighted voting rights beneficiaries published in October 2020 further opened the gate for Greater China issuers that are controlled by one corporate weighted voting rights beneficiary or a group of corporate beneficiaries acting in concert, being the largest shareholder controlling not less than 30% of the total shareholders' votes and primarily listed on either the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the London Stock Exchange May Market Premium Listing segment on or before October 30th of 2020 to apply for secondary listing in Hong Kong. These issuers, also known as qualifying corporate weighted voting rights issuers, will need to be an innovative company and shall satisfy the qualifications for listing set out in Chapter 19C of the listing rules in order to be eligible for secondary listing on the main board. The total number of new listings in 2020 under the new listing regime, i.e. the biotech companies, innovative companies with weighted voting rights structures and concessionary secondary listings, was 27 compared with 11 in 2019 and 7 in 2018, showing an increase by 145% and 286% respectively. We can certainly expect this number to continue to grow this year. The consultation period for the proposed increase in profit requirement just ended on the 1st of February this year. It will take a couple of months before the consultation conclusion is published and we will find out by then which option the stock exchange will adopt. With the publication of the consultation, the stock exchange expects an influx of listing applications prior to the effective date of increase in the profit requirement. As at the end of January, the stock exchange has a accepted 15, 12, and 17 new listing applications in three months since the publication of the consultation paper. These numbers actually reflect a decrease in the number of applications compared with the previous six months, which ranged from 18 to 33 applications per month. But we shall see whether the number of applications accepted in the coming months prior to the effective date of the new profit requirement will increase as the stock exchange expects. And um, that brings us to the end of my sharing today. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm handing back over back to you, Olga. Uh, thank you, Simon. That was very uh, insightful. Um, so we'll pass on to Henry now, who can share more in relation to the transformation of financial services industry. 
Hello and good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, actually, I think. Give me a second to share my slides. I mean, I really appreciate everyone coming and spending their lunch hour with all of us here today. Let me share that. Fantastic. Well, today I am going to be talking about the future of digital securities. You know, this last month, really ever since Christmas, there has been a massive inflow of interest into digital assets generally, and especially things like Bitcoin. You know, if you asked me six months ago how long it would take for digital assets to become mainstream, I would have said, I don't know. That I think that this is an inevitable trend, but maybe it'll take a few years. Today, I am convinced that 2021 is going to be a tipping point for digital assets. And by the end of this year, not everybody will own digital assets, but everybody will have heard of them. And certainly every financial institution will have a digital asset strategy. I am just going to give you a quick overview of our corner of the industry, which is focused on digital securities. And then maybe if a bit of time, would love if you type questions in the chat. Um, we'd also love to hear if you have any questions about actually working in the digital asset industry. Uh, and certainly Fusang is aggressively hiring these days. First things first though, what are digital securities? To me, digital securities are not a new asset class. They are analogous to the shift from when we had open outcry trading in, in the, the, the pits of stock markets to when all that trading went electronic. It was still the same underlying assets being traded. Likewise, digital securities, at least the way that we have constructed them, are not a new asset class. They're not some strange new creation. All we're doing is taking traditional securities, things like shares, bonds, funds, etc., and converting them into digital token-based representations where these tokens sit on blockchains. And this really, I won't go too much into these slides because I, I think I've got to whiz through them pretty fast. But if you can see here on this, this Venn diagram, to me, the confluence of what we call dematerialization, which is a shift from um, physical paper-based shares to having effectively what I call pictures of shares, PDFs, or having ledger entries in a database, uh, plus the tokenization of assets, putting assets onto blockchains, um, plus the fact that the, the settlement cycle today is very, very messy, where you have lots and lots of different parties involved in everything from trading to settlement to post-settlement. These things added together, I think, are the real drivers for digital securities, as you can see here in this slide. And as I said, I think that this is a one-way street, that the, the digitization of assets is inevitable because this is not unique to the financial services industry. This is something that is actively happening in every other industry in the world, where you have a shift from offline to offline, uh, off, offline to online, to mobile first, to the what I call the disintermediation of certain value chains. And I'll talk a bit about that um, later on. Um, but skipping ahead, I can show you this slide again. To me, the, the financial markets today have, uh, run a B to B to C model. You have layers and layers of intermediaries. You've got stock exchanges in the middle, clearing houses, depositories, brokers, custodians. All of these market players go into creating this ecosystem. This is, to me, just like once upon a time, if you used to make clothes and you wanted to sell them, you would go to a department store like Lane Crawford as the clothing uh, designer and you'd say, please Lane Crawford, please carry my clothes and please put them in the front of your store. And if a big sales channel like Lane Crawford was willing to do that, you were off to the races. And if none of these department stores were willing to cover you, uh, you were screwed. Right? You didn't have those distribution channels and you had to interface with all kinds of different parties in that whole process of just getting your goods from you, the seller's hands, into the buyer's hands. You had to talk to warehouses, you had to talk to payment agents, lots and lots of a B2B to C process. That shifted with the advent of e-commerce. And today you no longer have a lots and lots of steps. You've got someone like Amazon sitting directly in between buyer and seller. 
where sellers can sell products directly to the end consumers. And to me, again, that's really why digital securities are so exciting. The blockchain allows us to replace a lot of that financial market infrastructure in the middle that you see in this slide. And then you just need a vastly reduced set of parties to run that B2C model between buyer and seller. Uh, again, I'll whiz through some of these slides pretty fast, except to say the key takeaways are that um, there is a huge amount of regulatory support for digital securities. I hear a lot of complaining um, in our industry that regulators don't support digital securities, and we certainly found that not to be true. Uh, we find that regulators are just unhappy if you try and skirt the rules. But if you follow all of the existing rules, Securities and Futures Acts, etc., they are more than happy to support new technology. And certainly we are seeing an increasing volume of digital securities being created. Uh, the question is why? Why are people so interested? And I think it comes down to a couple of dimensions. One is, as the speaker before me was mentioning, uh, traditional stock exchanges like HPX are raising their requirements for what they want to see in public companies. There is also a burgeoning venture capital industry providing capital to very early stage private companies. But you've got this big gap in between where you have a lot of companies that run real businesses, they're making real profits, but if they're not big enough to be publicly listed, they are almost cut out of traditional capital markets. Publicly listed companies can issue bonds, private companies, all you can do really is you go talk to your local bank uh, and you maybe get a term loan. If that, banks these days don't really lend, um, you know, the way they used to, where you could show up with a business plan uh, and they would fund a new business big banks today lend against assets or they lend against cash flow. And all of this, I think, is why, as I said, that B2B2C model is rapidly collapsing into a B2C model, where that entire transactional value chain is getting disintermediated and people are starting to go direct to the end consumer. And we see this in the data and we see it today. Um, this is a chart of digital securities specifically. Uh, you can see here from a very low basis in USD billions. Um, the issuance volume studies show is projected to grow at a 60% growth rate every year and is going to explode in the years to come. And actually, from the current data, we see this is actually a little conservative for these charts. But even so, a comment I hear about digital assets broadly and cryptocurrencies is, well, I hear the market isn't that big. And that's true in terms of market cap. The total market cap of digital asset markets today is just over a trillion dollars. That's not even half the size of Apple is today. But the real story is this. The digital asset markets have turnover. They've got a transaction volume like no asset class the world has ever seen. In the middle there is a chart of global equities turnover daily. Last year, every single day, on average, there were about $200 billion worth of public market listed equities changing hands. Last year for digital assets, that was about $120 billion, uh, about 60% of global equities turnover. This year, in this January alone, that's increased even more. And I'm willing to bet by the end of this year, that transaction volume is actually going to surpass global equities turnover. And I just want to let that sink in for a second, where you have a relatively new asset class that is trading on a daily basis, more volume than every listed stock on the planet. And that just goes to show the huge amount of interest that there is in digital assets today. But there are regulatory problems, not in my opinion, because regulators are not open minded, but because lots and lots of people are quite frankly trying to skirt the rules. And I won't talk too much about this. I'm sure you've all heard in the press about fines being levied left, right and center for people running unlicensed exchanges or people trading unlicensed securities. And even though more and more regulators are coming up with guidelines, there are still people trying to issue these ICOs or utility tokens. Uh, in my personal opinion, 95% of these things are scams. And certainly multiple regulators, including the SEC in America, are starting to go after some of these tokens for being unregistered securities offerings. And that is why, well, we Fusang personally believe that there is a huge industry white space. And I think uh, my, my um, colleague Ken is going to talk a bit more about this later, but we think there's a huge scope for regulated exchanges to come step in and play that role just like a traditional stock exchange would or 
traditional capital markets, but for digitized token based securities. And that really is why Fusang, at least as a company, is so keen on this entire marketplace, taking the same underlying blockchain technology that underpins assets like Bitcoin, but using it to represent digital securities, real world shares, bonds, real estate funds, and etc. And when we do so, I think we can finally fix this massive broken value chain that you have in financial markets today. And this story of distance mediation of a shift from a B to B to C model to a B to C model, this is not new. Uh, Amazon, for example, pioneered this model really, really well. And Amazon's one insight really when they first came along and when they were first competing with eBay, for those of you who are old enough to remember, is that eBay matched buyers and sellers. What Amazon realized is that that wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough just to match a trade, so to speak. You needed to provide the underlying end-to-end -end fulfillment. You needed to be able to help a seller take a good, get it into the buyer's hands and vice versa. The buyer just wants to press a button, pay money and have their stuff show up on your doorstep. And when Amazon stepped into doing fulfillment, that's when the whole Amazon empire really started to take off. When they realized that what people needed was this end-to-end -end platform and not just individual chopped up services like you have in the financial market today, as I said. And this is not only happening in areas like e-commerce, this is happening and has happened in places like the financial uh, industry. I should have actually paused and asked you guys to guess at this, but most people, I think, would be surprised to learn that the biggest financial services companies on the planet today are Visa and MasterCard. They, Visa and MasterCard, they don't issue credit cards, they don't have a balance sheet, but because they own what I call a transactional value network, because whenever you walk into a restaurant outside of China, at least, and you swipe a credit card, they take a small transaction fee. I, the, 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 the consumer at the restaurant, all I care about is I want to swipe my card and I want the money to get to the restaurant. Likewise, all the restaurant cares about is a convenient mechanism in order to collect that money. They don't really care about how that machinery happens in the middle. They just need someone who can provide that as an end-to-end -end service. And I think this chart on the right tells the entire story. When you look at the companies that are highlighted in yellow, these are all platform-based companies owning a transactional value chain. And today, these are the biggest companies on the face of the planet, at least in terms of financial services. And then you look at the big four Chinese SOE banks, for example, and those four banks have grown in any possible measure you care to highlight in terms of size, in terms of revenue, and yet their market cap has fallen over the past five years. And I think that just tells the whole story that the market is no longer valuing these kind of companies based on very traditional centralized models based on having big balance sheets. The companies that are valued in today's world are platform companies that can own an end-to-end -end transactional value chain uh, and that can actually do what I call the, so the whole fulfillment process, really help buyers and sellers swap uh, and meet. And self-serving promotion, that's what Fusang has tried to build. Now, a single mission has been to build an end-to-end -end platform allowing all investors everywhere, whether individual, institutional, or retail, to be able to trade in a variety of investment products at low and transparent fees. And to that end, uh, we've built Asia's first digital stock exchange. And if you guys are interested in learning more about the roles that we have open in terms of joining us, um, we work with Michael Page a lot get in touch with one of them um, and I'm sure there will be plenty of interesting and exciting things to be done but I've got about a minute left and I just want to talk a bit about uh, our industry and talk a bit about people actually working in our industry because that's the question I get a lot. I see a huge number of people working at traditional banks who are very rapidly looking at the digital asset industry and trying to decide whether or not they should make the leap and you know, to me, the single question that you should be asking yourself is why do you think the financial system is somehow going to escape the exact same disintermediation that has come to every other industry on the planet? Again, COVID has forever changed the way that we all do business. If you didn't believe in digital before, uh, you need to believe in digital today. And everybody, certainly people growing up in today's generation, are going to prefer a digital interface to a traditional one. Many of them actually prefer to interact with an app instead of a human being. 
and you're certainly very open to the concept of digital assets. And if anything, I think I'm more comfortable the concept of digital assets than traditional assets. And just one very last anecdote because my time is up. But you know, I got into this industry a few years ago. At least we made a decision to really take the full-fledged plunge into providing exclusively digital asset infrastructure because I read one news article. I remember this was back in 2017 when Fortnite had first come out. And if any of you have children, I guarantee that they play uh, Fortnite. And I remember reading that as the six months old game had sold 400 million US dollars worth of virtual in-game items. These were not items that made you better at the game. These were items that were purely cosmetic. They just made your avatar in the game look better. And I said, if people are willing to spend $400 million on virtual items, they'll spend $400 million on digital securities. Anyway, I think that is all the time I have today. And again, if you have questions, type them in the chat and I'll do my best to, to respond to you. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, so I have not yet invested in digital mm -hmm. assets, but I think I'm very compelled to do so now. Um, so I'll hand <laughs> over to the next speaker, Let us Ken. Know. Um, Ken will um, uh, present for us um, on, on sharing more about the talents that um, could be suitable for the wealth management and capital markets um, sector. Sure, thanks a lot. And I appreciate uh, Michael Page that arranged this exciting panel and I'm great to share the panel with the other um, uh, friends and especially Henry, because we are also the digital assets applicant as well uh, in Hong Kong. So, so today I will be doing more interactive without any slides and, uh, and I'm in Hong Kong, I'm not in San Francisco, so uh, no hurry. So, uh, so again, uh, digital assets, I think there are a lot of uh, recruitment opportunity. A lot of the people ask is, how is um, the FinTech uh, trend right, happening in the wealth management and capital market because that's where Hong Kong is very really strong. Right? So that's why I think if we just step back in the past five to six years, Hong Kong is advocating a lot of the fintech development and there's a lot of support from government, regulators, uh, and also financial service uh, teams right? that they're wrapping up the digital team or there are a number of new initiatives such as the virtual bank and virtual uh, insurance happening as well, right? So a lot of the heated discussion around in the retail and SME side. But what are the opportunities for people that are interested right, in capital market or wealth management? And I think the same message I want to echo with Henry is as well is digital assets, right? Where we see there are a lot of opportunities that is akin to the traditional securities but using the latest technology, including blockchain, right? To revolutionize the traditional market, especially in wealth management capital market. So that's why today I want to share the, the topic with you guys is if you are in the traditional market, but you are not in retail, you are not in SME, right? Where are the opportunities lying from? So again, I want to articulate is in Hong Kong, right? There are a number of new regulations coming up around the virtual assets, which include cryptocurrency and security token offering. Right. And in the market, there are a lot more uh, coherence uh, voices around the security market, uh, security token offering, uh, STO, which is access back, is a security, and it could be a new form of fundraising, right, to the traditional IPO that the first speaker also mentioned around the landscape as well, right. So that's why we see that in Hong Kong, there could be a lot of different digital assets exchanges, right, such as Henry or myself, Hong Kong BH that we are looking for talents with such background, number one. Number two, there would be an increasing demand right, from the asset management side where they want to invest into crypto. They want to invest into security token offering, which is assets backed and in security, right? But how could they make an investment decision, right? So they also need traditional financial talents, including the broker, the sponsors, Right, a lot of the corporate finance specialists, but they are willing to dip the toe into the new area called, called digital assets. Right, but I think the fundamental skill sets are very, very essential as well. So I, I also see that that number of assets management firms in Hong Kong focusing in uh, investing in crypto and also STO, right, which we call virtual assets in Hong Kong. In other jurisdictions, we call digital assets, right. But these two terms can be used interchangeably. Having said that, so I, I see there are a number of firms, as mentioned, asset management firm and exchange in Hong Kong wrapping up for this kind of talent. So 
you, you may feel, okay, there are some opportunities out there. So how can you equip with such, right? There are a number of ways that I would encourage everyone to equip with that in your CV, right? So a uh, uh, great headhunter like Michael Page, right, can help you and uh, prioritizing and pitching you to the right candidate as well. So I think number one is, it's very important to show that you have relevant FinTech experience, right? If you are working in a traditional security, financing uh, firm, etc., no worries, right? How can you upgrade yourself, right? Either you can study different online courses or there are a number of master programs uh, in Hong Kong, different universities offering such part-time or full-time master course, right? So at least, right, you can have a broader uh, understanding around FinTech, right, by equipping yourself either in uh, a part-time or full-time master course offered in Hong Kong, or there are a number of online courses even in Cloudera or Adex, right? There are there are courses related to blockchain, right? So, and there are, and, and I think they, they could offer you uh, some online certificate, right? You may pay, I think less than like 300 US dollar, right? To get certified after you study this course. So I think at least, right? You need to give your recruiter and your future employee to say that you are paying the effort, right? You are transforming yourself to FinTech, right? So there are a lot of different uh, courses available out there. So please, do scout for such that's number one number two i think is uh uh um there's a bad or that's a bad or good uh even for the COVID situation right the bad thing is there are a lot of offline events that you could connect to the fitness ecosystem but it would be less but still if you look at the broader and the brighter side right there are a lot more online zoom or 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 equivalent events out there Right. There are a lot of renowned speakers from globally invited to such, right? So attach yourself to different associations, right? Like AIMA, IMA, or Hong Kong SI, right? Or um, or Hong Kong Fund Association, etc. So I see that they host a lot of different um, I would say uh, uh, topics around fintech and also digital assets as well in the past six months, right? So you should uh, leverage your company resources or your personal resources to join these associations and to hear more around this kind of webinar, right? And you have to become proactive as well, right? You can add these people in the LinkedIn, reach out to them, get a coffee, get a call to really understand that what they are, right? When you are in the FinTech. So a lot of people always ask me about what's your life, right? When you join the FinTech and also being a professor in this space, right? I would say is you have to experience yourself, right? And there's no better way to ask people that already in FinTech. Right, so there are a lot of people asking me about what's the best in fintech. Right? A lot of people have a fantasy, right? When you talk about technology or, or fintech, and you would emphasize the working environment would be a lot better than the current one. It could be yes, right? But also the culture, the expectation, the pace would be very different to the traditional field. So what I would suggest to everyone is if you have an interest to transform yourself to be fintech. Talk to more people in fintech, right? Understand their um, their transformation path, right? Understand the sacrifice and the trade off they have made as well, right? And you have a better preparation, right? From a mental perspective, from your CV perspective, right? In order to pound through on the fintech side. And I think third, very important is if you want to transform into more a, a fintech expert as well, it do uh, try to. Uh, uh, look up for some coding courses, right? You may not need to become a technology expert, but at least you need to understand the uh, relevant uh, experience in how to code it, right? At least you go to the GitHub to read on some code, right? To ask your friends that are real experts in this. So you get a better feel about what does that really mean, right? So I think as a FinTech expert, right? You need to amass three different skill sets. Number one, the basic financial knowledge. Right, the corporate finance, right? How you structure the products. I think that's basic. Second, you need to have an understanding about technology. And more important, I'm not saying that you have to code, you have to learn how to build an app yourself. But at least you know how to apply the technology in the right scenario and product. Ask the right questions to your engineers about how you build the product, how long it will be, right? What does it take for such, right? What are the resources required to build this kind of thing? So you build your great understanding and sense in how to apply the technology. Technology cannot achieve the great ends, right? It's a means, right, to help you to enable the transformation. So, and more important is there are a lot of hair 
around the technology, right? A lot of people saying blockchain and AI, big data, we always hear this on buzzword, but very carefully we need to understand what is the best way to apply this, right? And how do we combine different technologies to create a better synergy for particular scenarios? So I think this is very important. Third, you have to have a basic understanding towards legal and compliance. So FinTech is always about innovation. And, and good or bad is FinTech is a highly regulated industry. It's very, very different to other industry where you can, you can apply innovation without ignoring the compliance of regulation. So you have to understand your frame, right? You have to understand what the boundaries of your industry are and you can apply the innovation. But if you're not fully aware of the legal and regulation or compliance framework that you are working in, either you're in retail, SME, wealth management, and capital market, right? For example, if you want to become an access manager, you want to become a crypto lead trader, you have to understand, is there any particular rules, right? Or trading limits for access management firms to invest in the crypto, right? If you apply a Hong Kong Type 9 license, right? How should the funding set up, right? Uh, so all these questions relate to the legal and compliance understanding, which could have fundamental impact to your businesses as well. So to recap, I think number one, there are a lot of firms in Hong Kong, either they are the exchanges, either they want to become access managers, they, they want to recruit talents with Pyron Digital Asset Experience. Sadly, there are not too many talents in this space. So if you're willing to take some risk, Right, one or two years later, you'll be super hot in the market, I'm sure, because a lot of people will be foreign into this space. And with one to two year or three years experience, you are already a venture, right? So this gives you a, a huge premium in terms of the recruitment market. Two, I think for FinTech talent, you have to acquire the basic financial knowledge, technology application, and also the legal compliance or regulation understanding. And to transform yourself, you have to take the action now. Take some courses online or offline, right? Two, join more seminars uh, hosted by different associations. Three, really talk to the people about how a day looks like in FinTech, right? Don't make any false fantasy, right? Before you join into a field, right? So I will stop it here first. Uh, uh, happy to take any comments uh, in the Q&A session. And thank you again for the invite. And I'll pass to the next panel for another exciting discussion. Uh, thank you, Ken. That was very um, helpful. Um, so I think any uh, any participants who have interest to join the fintech industry today, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or my team. So finally, we have um, Mr. Dixon Wong, who will share a little bit more um, from the Hong Kong SAR perspective in terms of um, what sort of projects they're investing in and just give an overview of, of the market for this year. So over to you, Dixon. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. And thank you, uh, all the speakers for the insightful views and also thank you very much for Michael Page for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, Olga, you have mentioned about the increase in headcounts, uh, increase in uh, job opportunities, as well as the uh, the increase in salary. That's even more important, I think, um, a, a, as a highlight uh, for the financial sector. Uh, in short, it's very positive, dynamic, although it is changing given the number of uh, transformation taking place as highlighted by Ken earlier. So uh, perhaps I just, you know, would uh, talk about, you know, because uh, the topic today is talent. Um, I just highlighted and extracted uh, a, key, a key, uh charts from the uh, recent uh, uh, survey uh, from the Hong Kong Institute of Bankers. As you can see here, uh, three categories as the skill gaps you know i think uh, why I, I extract the banking sector because I, I think more or less the same that applies to the other subsectors within uh financial services so as you can see that the chart here uh, despite the strong demand for technical and data skills this exercise uh identified a shortage of skills and therefore the largest uh, skill gap in these areas uh in the development survey 87 percent of the respondents identify technolo technological skills as the largest skill gap in the, in the financial or banking sector, followed by the knowledge on cybersecurity, 80%, and 
and data skills 75%. So all three groups of survey respondents attached the most importance to the skills, uh, common views shared both uh, inside and also outside uh, the banking and financial sector. And also uh, Henry and uh, Ken, they have highlighted, you know, digital securities as an example. I think technological skills is definitely uh, not a new thing, but, you know, is embedded in the day-to-day -day life or the work that uh, each individual in the financial sector should, should enhance in order to, to do a better job um, for themselves. Uh, this slide um, indicates the, um, the importance of core knowledge and skills in the, in the banking or financial sector. So in an overwhelming 76% uh, of the survey, uh, respondents considered the core banking knowledge and skills would remain as important asset of the uh, practitioner in the next five years. I think Ken has highlighted earlier, you know, the basic financial and core knowledge is needed. For example, the legal compliance, credit, and these are the fundamental uh, basic core skills that individuals should, post, uh, should embed in, in, in the work. But apart from that, uh, I, I have to admit, you know, technological skills as highlighted in the earlier slide is an important one. So it, we, we should not, you know, all students or, you know, whoever interviewer, interviewees survey consider banking knowledge and skills as not important for future talent in contrast. Uh, only 2% of banking practitioners and shareholders who share the same. But I think in short, you know, transformation is happening. Um, and also Simon highlighted earlier in the, in the IPO space, you know, it's very promising, very active, very dynamic, but it, um, there, there's, there's some sort of uh, changes happening, you know, like for example, the, the, the due diligence work that can be done online, you know, which is very differently from what we, we, we did in the past uh, in terms of the IPO. Um, this chart, uh, very briefly, you know, creativity uh, was ranked. Um, this is some sort of the, uh, the soft skill gaps um, in the survey, you know, 73% uh, of the respondents as the most, uh, I think the uh, in the near future, this is uh, uh, the gaps we, we need to to close as is highly important uh, cross border networking skills you know the analytical skills are very important and i'll come back to this very shortly um very briefly about you know invest hong kong sector teams and network um we have uh, major sector teams um in the mass hong kong providing sectors coverage and i myself uh leading the uh, financial service team uh which is actually covering the banks, insurance companies, securities, PEVC, and the virtual banks, this sort of a client's portfolio. And what we are trying to do is to setting up a new family office team, which is uh, supported and sponsored by the uh, Financial Services and Treasury Bureau of the Hong Kong government. So uh, I will talk about this a little bit more, but uh, we, we have a global network of more than 30 offices around the world. So as you can see, on your right hand side, um, uh, we have a very strong uh, global network on the ground uh, to provide any investment support. And also if there's any clients on the ground, please feel free to let us know uh, through the local office or through Invest Hong Kong headquarters. So our mission on the uh, Global Family Office team, uh, this one is uh, actually, I've just highlighted earlier, you know, uh, we are going to set up a Global Family Office team and we are hiring, although I, I'm not allowed to, 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 to vote, but uh, because as a panelist, but uh, actually uh, Invest Hong Kong is hiring. And uh, this is again supported by the FSTB. We want to position ourselves as the uh, family office hub uh, uh, for Asia. So we'll provide one-stop services uh, for clients who are interested in setting up a family office in Hong Kong, uh, including those ultra high level of individuals. Uh, also, we'll we will build a network with the existing uh, family office investors on the ground here in Hong Kong already. We will build, um, uh, helping them to significantly um, providing a stronger network. So right now we have a, a financial services team on your left hand side. You can see I'm, I have a, a team of six members who are running the, who are helping me to, to manage and also help the financial services clients, including the banks, VC, virtual banks, insurance company, etc. And on the right-hand side, we are hiring, we are hiring. Uh, in Hong Kong, we will be 
having a team of five individuals uh, ranging from global uh, head to uh, SVP to VP. And apart from Hong Kong, we are also hiring uh, announcement will be made shortly. I think through the job ads, uh, we will be hiring a head of FO uh, in, London, uh, in in Europe, and also we will be hiring uh, two heads of FO in mainland, uh, highly likely based in uh, Guangzhou and also uh, Beijing. So there will be a total of eight individuals uh, in the global family office team. I will be looking after both teams. Um, this one uh, shows the collaborations that we are trying to explore. And actually some of them already happened. Um, you can see there are three red box, you know, on the right hand side regulators and uh, on the left hand side is the international association. On the bottom are the market players. So here are the major strategic action uh, for, for my teams at Invest Hong Kong. As you can see, we will, we, we will continue to support overseas and mainland financial institutions as uh, in, in my financial services team and the family offices in the newly set up uh, family office team uh, to help the investors to set up and also to expand in Hong Kong. So um, we will go through a major initiatives uh, over the next few slides. So here are a summary of our activities in the last um, 12 months. So we have been doing, this is just for my team, financial services. So we have been, we have conducted 16 webinars, 20 speaking engagement, 11 uh, virtual investment promotions, office opening, as well as uh, some other initiatives um, together with the stakeholders, including Hong Kong MA, SFC, uh, as well as FSTB and FSDC. So going forward, as you can see on the right hand side, we'll be doing a lot more. Uh, that's the only, uh, that's only a preliminary one, but uh, just to give you a quick look, uh, we are more than happy to, to explore other collaborations so to help attract more foreign direct investments to Hong Kong. Um, this is a very quick one, you know, um, I know time is running, so um, just very briefly, um, Hong Kong MA, uh, SFC, IA, and also searching, we have been collaborating with them to produce a pitch book, website, flyers, as well as uh, the brochures on many different topics covering uh, financial services, family office, work the Bay Area, insurance, and Bell and Road. So, um, we are actually the frontline uh, government agency to, to talk and also interact with the clients on behalf of the government. Um, this is another one more on the uh, with the market players. So uh, we, we have been doing this uh, with banks, big four, legal firms, and also uh, even property agents as well as uh, headhunters, including Michael Page. Um, so we will continue to do this so to help you know make the voice loud uh, uh, heard by other people you know uh, we would like to have more FDI coming to Hong Kong uh, not just financial services financial institutions but more uh, family offices uh, this one is a collaboration with the association so we have been uh, doing a lot of uh, webinars events unfortunately this year we have been uh, impacted by COVID, so what we can do is virtual ones. Last but not least, uh, here's a quick summary of our Invest Hong Kong services. Um, we help investors uh, from the planning stage, including uh, basic licensing requirement, tax, regulations, uh, what about uh, the, uh, the property markets, as well as the work visa. So we, we help investors to understand all this. Uh, in the planning stage before they come over to Hong Kong. So if they really have an interest in that, then they can talk, continue to talk to us. We will help them to line up with service providers, including lawyers, accountants, headhunters, etc., etc. Um, go to the launch. Once they set up in Hong Kong, they have the, you know, they have the business, they have the office up and running. We can continue to provide our services, including the PR, the marketing, you know, we also help them to uh, to grow in the city, for example, helping uh, them to connect with the uh, the association and all the, also the investors and uh, and investees. So it provides a much more wider network, social network, and uh, and expand the and to help expand the business. So these are all our services. Bear in mind, this is for free. So 
uh, please do use Imax Hong Kong services for FDI. If you have any interest uh, from your clients, your friends, your connections who are, you know, considering Hong Kong as a location for uh, for set up family office, or even they're already in Hong Kong, they want to expand, feel free to let us know. We are more than happy to assist. Um, I think I, I, I pause and uh, I pass over back to uh, Olga. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dixon. You're right on time. Um, so look, I'm conscious is I'm eating into everyone's lunch time, so we will only choose um, two questions for our guest speakers to answer to. Um, for the first one, I'll throw it over to Ken. Um, so one of our participants would like to know, um, for digital assets IPO, what are the usual key investors? Could you share a bit more on this? Sure. I, th I think for for, um, for Hong Kong, right, I, I speak for this jurisdiction. I think. Uh, for service token offering, uh, right now the regulation is for professional investors, right, which includes high number of individuals and all the uh, companies uh, that meet those requirements. Right? So just to quickly recap around the the, the landscape that we're talking about, for someone in Hong Kong, for high number of individuals, that means you have liquid assets more than US dollar one million, and uh, and uh, and broadly speaking, uh, there are around three hundred thousand high number of individuals in Hong Kong. Number one. Number two is if you are a corporate, either private or list company with more than 40 million cash, you also qualify as a professional investor. Third is if you have a license in SFC, right? Brokers, sponsors, advisors, asset management firms, you are also qualified as professional investors. So these groups of people, right, could be, uh, I would say, um, uh, 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 roomed, right, to purchase the security token offering and also crypto going first. So it's a huge market opportunity as such. And echo to what Dixon mentioned, so right now we also receive a lot of promising inquiries from Greater Bay Area, from Shenzhen or Shanghai. A lot of the funds in China also looking to uh, foray into Hong Kong to see how to set this up and also how to bring the mainland Chinese wealth into Hong Kong to invest into new asset class, right? So I think that definitely is something to uh, to really watch closely around the development. Great. Okay. So the next question, I'll throw it over to Henry. Um, there's a lot of questions around digital asset today, so um, we'll just pick one of the, the, the more standout ones. Um, how do you feel about Hong Kong's position in digital asset development across our APAC competitors or even global competitors? Yes. Um, we, we find that Hong Kong naturally as a financial market is also going to be a hub, I think, for digital assets as well. And to me, the most important thing for digital assets is where are the service providers sitting? Um, the truth is the world is getting more and more globalized. Investors are going to come from all over. Issuers, as in companies looking to create these securities, are going to start coming from all over. What always matters is not only where a company may technically operate, but more importantly, where the people are, which is why I guess we're all here and why we're talking to Michael Page today. You know, most businesses, or at least in the financial services industry, we are all people businesses. We're people sitting in front of computers, especially today in a post-COVID world. And ultimately what matters is where the people congregate. And I believe that Hong Kong going forward will continue to be a very important hub for that with both traditional and digital assets. I think you're on mute, Olga, as you're trying to talk. <laughs> or I can just keep rambling on as well. <laughs> so I think we have time for one last question. So I'll throw this one over to Dixon. Um, so outside of digital assets, how do you find Hong Kong's position um, when compared to um, our APAC competitors or global competitors in terms of our, our development? Dixon, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, thanks for reminding me. I think uh, it's a very good question. Uh, um, from a, I'm try, I tried to answer that, uh, but may not you know fully address all concerns from the audience. But I, I would say, from a regional perspective, you know, Hong Kong is often compared with other Asian cities. 
in many economic areas. Why I why I really think、um, cities in Asia have you know each would have their own merits in terms of attraction, in particular for global family offices and in terms of the specific financial regimes. So,、um, but many would agree that Hong Kong is part of China. And with its increasing roles in、uh, mainland's economic development, for example,、uh, the Greater Bay Area, so it makes a perfect gateway、uh, for family office to access the massive wealth management market arising, in particular from the GBA,、uh, which is obviously a growth engine for 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 for、uh, for the whole of、uh, Asia.、Um, Hong Kong is also famed for its、uh, traditional free market mechanism. So,、uh, and again, which is one of the most、um, important considerations for、uh, foreign investors when they choose where to base, where to base.、Um, if you allow me to say more about Greater Bay Area, I would, I would say, you know,、um, um, the Greater Bay Area, you know, contributes、uh, to the strong wealth、uh, growth momentum in Greater China. So、uh, approximately, you know, for for the entire China, there are eighty four thousand ultra high level families、um, in in Greater China, and、uh, increasingly by around twenty percent、uh, in the last three years,、um, more than twenty thousand ultra high level families are in the Greater Bay Area, including Hong Kong. So approximately twenty percent ultra high level families are based in Greater Bay Area. So、um, the valuation of unicorns in the Greater Bay Area obviously increased a lot, and uh, and uh, compared to 2017、uh, to now is approximately you know 300 billion RMB in 2017, and right now、uh, is already、uh, doubled to 600 billion、uh, RMB. So、uh, you know just three years. So implying what the value、uh, was doubled. In the last, I think, two and a half years, so all this demonstrate the、uh, the wealth creation is is very strong in Greater Bay Area, including Hong Kong.、Uh, Hong Kong is part of Greater Bay Area, so do the family office business.、Um, I think I, I just pause here, but、uh, to just give a very positive view about Hong Kong as part of Greater Bay Area. Great, thank you, Dixon. So we will have one last fun question. It's from the Michael Page team. It's for Simon. So Simon, given you the expert in IPO, and IPO market seems to be a bit more busy this year. Which one is your favorite upcoming IPO? And if you're not allowed to say, can you share which industry it is? Which industry? Well, of course, I'm not. I'm not allowed to say which. Um, <clears throat> IPO that I'm interested in.、Um, <laughs> but I think、um, the one in the TMT sector will be will be the more interested as as I've just mentioned earlier that this is going to be one of the、um, um, areas where where、uh, one of the sectors actually where the、um, where they have raised most. Of the IPO funds in the past two years, so I, I, I think this is one of the more interesting areas、um, that I would love to work in. Great, thank you. So thank、Thanks. you everyone for joining us today.、Um, as mentioned, we will share out the talent share report to every one of you、uh, that you've registered your emails with us. If you have any questions, you can reach out. And once again, thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you, Simon, Henry, Ken, and Dixon, and thank you very much to my team for putting this all together. We'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Thank you so thank much. You. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye.